And I'm Dr. Adam Jirachi. And you are listening to Love's a Secret Weapon podcast. And now it is my honor and pleasure to induct into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and about time to one of the greatest voices in the history of rock and roll, Miss Darlene Love. Welcome to another episode of Love's a Secret Weapon podcast. And boy, do we have a special guest on for you today. Darlene Love. What an illustrious career she's had. She came from a family whose father, Reverend Wright, influenced her very soul with the music of the church. Darlene and her sister, Edna, in fact, at one point sang background for Cher, who Darlene met on Shindig. And that's where the story begins. Donna and Darlene performed as cast members of Shindig, Donna as a soloist, and Darlene as one of the background singers with The Blossoms. Of course, Darlene had already sung the lead on He's a Rebel and He's Sure the Boy I Love, but Phil Spector, the legendary Wall of Sound guy, hired Darlene to record the lead vocal for The Crystals while they, what we enter the world of two of our favourite singers from the 60s when our own Donna speaks with Darlene Love. Go, Donna. Let me welcome Darlene Love with capital L. Darlene Love. Thank you for being on Love the Secret Weapon. Wow, that is a great title. (laughs) You're part of it. Yes. Thank you so much. I know I reached out to you because our mutual friend Mary, you know, her passing just recently was so sudden. Yes. And and we saw each other, three three amigas, right? Exactly. (laughs) exactly. I was looking at those pictures not too long ago because they're on my phone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was quite a reunion because I hadn't seen you for quite a long time. And no. so, yeah, it was just like, wow, you know, <laughs> history and, and legends. And then um, and then she's an angel. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I never, because I had just saw her. She did a couple of my Christmas shows, annual Christmas shows that I do in New Jersey. Uh-huh. And, um it was, it was it was like magic because I never seen Mary sing by herself. You know, it was always with the Supremes. You know, and then to <laughs> see her carry that torch for all those years after the Supremes were over, and to do her own thing. And I was thinking about all the things that that she did to keep it alive. You know, go out on tour with with the with the beautiful gowns that they had. You know, that had, that took a big imagination to do something like that. And people would actually receive it and then mm-hmm. to write her books which were I think she kind of started us all on writing our memoirs mm-hmm. I think before that we I really never really thought about writing a book about what I'd done and where I'd been and all the trials and tribulations <laughs> that I well, went through until yeah, I saw you're... Mary's you know what I mean yeah, I read your book and I read hers as well. And right. yeah, definitely, you know, it's it's so wonderful, you know, to uh, bear your soul on the page and give us that insight so we can have more empathy, you know, because you know we only see kind of what's happening on the surface. We and you give us an in-depth look, so we really appreciate that a lot. Yeah, and it's really great. And then when we see each other, which is all always amazing, because I never expected to see expected to see you and Mary in Palm Springs. 
This yeah, is well, amazing. And we never, and that's what happened to us over the years. We see each other in un, unexpected places. <laughs> <laughs> Just pop up. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, it's always like a real reunion. Well, Mary and I spent 21 days on a bus. Oh, um, wow. In 1964, just before I met you, uh, and we started doing Shindig. And so. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know that. Yeah, we all kind of merged. Yeah. Um, I was on the first Supreme Tour, and it was like in the beginning before Where Did Our Love Go charted. And then by oh. the end of the tour, you know they were they were top of the charts and and uh and I'll never forget you know y- you and the blossoms singing with the you know stop in the name of love you know right. the whole staff was involved right. and yeah I feel like you know because of your roots um and my love of gospel you know one of my favorite singers was Mahalia Jackson oh my and goodness yeah as a, as a kid I used to love Thing and he's got the whole world in his hands. And I wonder, yes. would would you just do me the honor of singing together a little tune for Mary? Oh, uh, which one? He's got the whole, the whole world. world in his hands. Hand. He's, he's got, got the whole world, world. in, in his, his hands. Hand. He's got the whole world, world. in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Oh, bless you. Bless you. Bless you, darling. Bless you, Mary. (laughs) My goodness. Well, you know, even in spirit, she brought us together. So that is so beautiful. And it is. It is. By the way, darling, you know, I did come to see you when you were working with little Stephen, and he put a band together, and you were at the Whiskey. Oh, my goodness. That was the opening of my new album we were doing. It was superb. Oh, my God. That was so wonderful. I I can still feel that working with, 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 with Bruce and with Stephen was like working with Phil Spector. It oh. was, and only it was live. And let, let me tell you something. I couldn't hear for two days. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't realize how loud they, they play. They play like. Playing, like they're playing for thousands and thousands of people, even within a small room. That's but it true. was really magical. It was so magical. I wish I could have seen you then. Well, it was elevating, you know. And actually, you know, Mary was there with me as she went upstairs to say hello to everyone. And I have a, I have basically a kind of a shy streak in me, so I stayed downstairs. Oh but, wow! <laughs> but but yeah, <laughs> that was enjoyable. Uh, but it was like. The music, I remember, you know, going in the studio a lot and, and when the, all the musicians are playing and they lift you, it's almost like you're floating. Oh, yeah. oh, and that's yeah. what it felt like that night with you and, and little Steven. It was totally magic, but it was elevating. You were lifted. It is. That's what it is. And I think that's why I, I so much enjoy uh, performing live because not only do you lift your spirit, you also lift Everybody else's spirit. That's watching you. And if people really knew what they do to you. <laughs> oh man, I know, I know that feeling. I mean, I feel actually, you know, I feel it every day. And when I started this podcast, you know, the whole idea is connecting. And however we can connect. You know, right. even if we can't touch each other or see each well, yeah, we can see each other on Zoom, you know. Right, Sometimes right, right. We have to overcome these these uh these obstacles and, and eliminate the distance and you know, I really feel I really feel your heart. So tell me tell me what are your plans once the doors start opening up? I, I read on your uh on your last post that you were itching to get back on stage. Oh yeah, I am, you know, and and then this year well last year now, it was so heartbreaking not to be able to be out there because my time is the time of the year where it's my favorite time of the year anyway at Christmas time because I always say it's a really a time where everybody forgets about everything and become givers and not takers. You know Thank what you. I mean? Thank you. And, and it's always so much fun. But this year, my we kept told, what am I going to do? I'm not going to be able to get there. So my publisher said, why don't we do a, a, a live show? 
Mm-hmm. So, um, and then it, once we said let, then everybody jumped on the bandwagon, not thinking okay. about how much this was going to cost. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but we did, you know, and it was so inspiring to do it. And what I love about it was all the people who who have something they said they loved it, they did it, refreshed them, that they it took them their memories back, you know. And it, it was all worth every. It was like a fourteen hour day. You know, oh, it was nice. very long and it was tedious and you had to be careful because of you had to wear gloves and you had to wear masks and mm. they had to clean and, oh, child, listen. But it was <laughs> worth every bit. It was well, to get it done. you? No, it was just me by myself and my Oh, my goodness. And my band. Oh, oh, you yeah. were you were the choir. Okay. That was good. Right. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that's what, I wanted to have my choir there, but it was just way too much to have the band and the singers and me there without the, being six feet apart. So mm-hmm, you know what? Mm-hmm. I said I was going to do it again this year. I haven't put the word out yet, but I want them to, you know, I'm going to do it again because it was so refreshing. Beautiful. And after after you do it, people can still see it. That's you know, right. You can go on YouTube now and see it for free. I it will go and do that. Absolutely. So you can go on Love for the Holidays, and it's still out there, which is a great thing. Once you put it on film, like taking a picture, it is out there. And I you want know, to the carry thing. the message. Yeah, I want to carry your whole, message. Yes, and it's the whole thing of staying connected because I got in, the people with the, I don't know if you know, the red dress uh, thing they do every year. Yeah, yeah, sure. They got in touch with me last year, and I did it for them. And it, Now, what you want to talk about a wonderful organization because I did have a heart attack seven years ago. Oh, my. And could live to tell about it, so they really wanted me to be a part of it, so we could talk about it, which was wonderful. This year was amazing; we couldn't do it, so they asked us to take pictures of, uh, of us in our house, with whatever we were doing. It was funny. I put I have this red coat that my husband bought me for Christmas about huh. seven or eight years ago, oh. so I, and it was snowing here like crazy. <laughs> oh, I put yeah. that coat on. I put my wig on and my sunglasses, and went out there and rolled in the snow. <laughs> Well, well, your method of, you know, Christmas is the time to give yes. and not to take. And what you've done is you've created an infinite message of just giving. Yes. yes. And and now that we can go on YouTube and watch you any time, you've got right. that Christmas spirit every day. And this year was really amazing because me and my husband decided to really give this year financially to organizations and street people, people that are on the street, people that are in need. And we called all our family and all our close friends that we give gifts to every Christmas and told them that we were not giving out Christmas gifts this year, meaning we had gotten to the place anyway. I think after you get a certain age, you start just really giving to the children that's and true. not to the adults. <laughs> yeah. you know. And that's what we did this year. We just rode around in the neighborhood. You know, and if we saw somebody, we'd call them over to the car and just give it to them and say, God loves you. Merry Christmas. Oh, you know, I and love just that. Keep on going. And I, you know what? That stirred up such a spirit in us that we decided that's what we're going to do next year also. Absolutely. You gave well, me a great you know, idea, too. Donna, you know, all year long we're giving to our family, to our children, you know, to friends, you know. So let's, let, let's make Christmas really be what it's supposed to be. It's God so loved the world that he gave. So let's make that what we do at Christmas time. I think that's the best thing we can do. To everybody, in the, people couldn't believe it. That's the way you pick up people's spirits. Mm-hmm. You have more than they do anyway. So let's but I get bet it. You, I bet you do that every day. Oh, uh, I try. I try. You it's know, a I mean. Hard. It's a little hard, you know. Well, uh, I find, you know, that even a look, you know, just. You yes. kind of see somebody twinkle in their eye, even when they're wearing a mask. Yes. And, you know, you go to the market or whatever you have to do, and, and you take a peek, and I don't know. <laughs> you can, you have to do a lot of with your eyes today. So, you know, that's what we've always done, but we don't even realize it. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, but that's the eyes to the soul, right? Yes. It is the eyes or the eyes to the soul. That's so true. That's so true. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Before we before – we, we, uh, you know, get too far into this. I sure want to kind of ha- ask you your memories of Shindig. Oh my goodness! 
those are the members that will last forever, no matter where I go, how old I get, no matter what's going on in my life, I will remember Shindig because for almost two years, we all bonded. All of those people who were on that show, who came to that show, we looked for, we met every star there was in the 60s and the 70s. All of those people came through Shindig. And we met them all. It was not one, I can't even think of one act that came there who were, were grace, you know, grateful and, and happy to meet us. They called us the stars because yeah. we were on the show every week. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. They were honored to meet us. And we said, no, 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 we're honored to meet you. So it was one of those things back and forth, you know, with all, even with the band, you know, because they were part of the wrecking crew. That Absolutely. Band that sure. Did. And look how many people became famous, like the Righteous Brothers became famous after Rick they Russell. Ra- yeah. well, well, we won't even think about Sonny and Cher. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> I mean, there, so, you know, the, even the, the band members became famous, you know. Yep. So it was, uh, uh, you know, it, it was amazing, all those people. Leon Russell, you know, it's amazing. I hadn't seen Leon Russell in years. And when I got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so did Leon Russell. He got mm-hmm. inducted the same time I did. Mm-hmm. So, you know, through life, meeting all those people that we met, a lot of those people are not here anymore, Donna, but there are still a lot of them that are still here and still oh, yeah. working and mm-hmm. still doing what they can to keep their name, keep working and things like that. So that was the beginning of really working, working hard. Mm-hmm. Realize mm-hmm. there is another part of this business. It's not just TV because we started off as background singers, and we mm-hmm. met actually Jack Good working doing background for Jackie DeShannon. God bless him. I love oh, no. him so much. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you know, and he, in Shindig, we all really did become a family because for two years, I mean, we that's all we did. We didn't have time to do anything else. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. took up that whole week. It went yep. from one week to the next week. And do you remember, actually, we were doing Shindig do, during the Watts riot. Oh, yes. The thing about it, well, where I had to come from, I had to pass through all of that to get to Hollywood to do Shindig because that's when we were doing it. So it was a time and a time and a half that we will never forget that, no matter how long we live or what, what's happening now in the world, not just in America. But what is happening in the world, we will always remember Shindig that well, started the rock and roll on television. Oh, that, yeah. You know, rock and roll just exploded after Shindig. Oh, yeah. Well, Jack Good, you know, he just brought it all to <laughs> to America. And yes. uh, and may I, may I tell you, you know, not too long ago, I was invited to uh, um, a Christmas party uh, for Bobby Sherman. Oh, and, really? Yeah, and Bobby had Bill Medley there. Well, that was the year before I went. I went and did his Christmas show last year. Okay. Okay. So, you know, Bobby Sherman is a mess. He looks exactly the way he did when he was on the <laughs> Only he had on his a police uniform. I said, yes. a policeman? You know, that's the last person I think would become a policeman. I know. And I well, fell wait in a minute. love with his wife. Oh, my goodness. Well, wait a minute. He started out in in ER, you know, and and I I told him I said, well, if I want anybody to resuscitate me mouth to mouth, <laughs> it would be him, right? <laughs> oh, that's hysterical. <laughs> they do these big big Christmas parties every year for all the organizations that they that they support. It, it is amazing. And their school in Ghana. So they uh, got this done right in time. And then Bobby Bobby Sherman had me to come when they renewed their wedding vows and sing, Today I Met the Boy I'm Going to Marry. Oh. That, now, that was another moment. <laughs> that is perfect. Well, you know. I'm gonna I'm gonna incorporate so much of your music in this podcast to well, that'll be you great. Know, pay tribute to you and and everyone's gonna rock out and you know my collaborator is in Adelaide Australia and oh so, really yeah we'll be we'll be you know heard well all over the world but we'll be heard in Australia and here and and everywhere so 
That's you know, amazing because I got a chance to go to uh, uh, Australia and and work over there. I did uh, a couple of weeks in Australia. It was that was another magical place we all went to to find out mm-hmm. they don't believe in tipping. Oh, oh wait a minute! What do you mean? You know they don't believe in tipping because they pay you a big enough salary where you don't have to get a tip. Oh, they're generous. That blew my mind, honey. <laughs> Because <laughs> I was trying to, we was like, well, no, 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 we have to tip. No, 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 we don't. And then I, we got to know the people, and they said, no, they give us a big enough salary where we don't have to tip. Mm. Oh, Lord, if we could come to that, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, that's that's the goals, one of the goals that we, we just have to keep opening our hearts. Yes, exactly, exactly. You know, now, yeah. where do you live exactly in Palm Springs? I thought the whole Palm Springs was hot. Oh. <laughs> well, it is hot, but in many ways, you know, it's really exploded um, as a cultural scene for mid-century modern and, you know, all the wonderful things, all the cars, the Corvettes and the Mustangs and the, you know, all those amazing uh, dresses that we used to wear, the mini dresses and everything. Yeah, that's amazing. How the, and, and, and it used to be the place for Hollywood many, many years ago, back in, the, I guess, the 30s and the 40s. But now it has become the place for younger people to hang out. Yeah. Well, I think when Coachella started, you know, yes. um that it brought in uh, people like Jay Z and Beyonce mm-hmm. and people and you know my my son was is a drummer and he was he was working with Tom York from Radiohead and and so I got to go to Coachella one year and and uh, and and he put me in one of those um, sound booths in the middle oh, of my the goodness. field with, with about seventy five thousand people and Ooh. and who else was in who else was in this little sound booth with was Jay Z and Beyonce. <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, you know, we the last year we did that uh, the show there, the Follies, right? The, I did the closing of the the Follies, and that was the first year they had that. I've never seen so many people in my life. I told my husband, I said, "I'm glad we're leaving." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, it's inundated. Oh yeah, but yeah. of course now we're taking time off, so everybody's right, right. taking time off and finding alternatives like you did with your Christmas show. So Yeah, we have to find, you know, alternatives doing by agent was calling me saying, Well, we got a little something might be going toward the end of the year or the summer the outdoor things we might be doing, you know. You have but, to be uh, innovative. Yeah, and I don't know when they're going to start going back inside. You know, I think that'll be another uh, maybe a year or so away. As okay. soon as everybody's all vaccinated. That's right. And we're going to all right. start being together again because I haven't seen my children are all still in California, my grandchildren, my mm. great-grandchildren. Mm. And so and I haven't seen them, you know, it's been over a year. I talk yeah. to them and I do FaceTime with them, but I haven't actually felt them, which I want to do because I tell everybody, you know, I'm a huggy kissy. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, I know I just heard, um, you know, something that was described about our new president, and he, and what they say is he's the grandpa that wants to hug his yes. grandchildren. Yes, that's me. I'm a yep, huggy yep. kissy. When they me. see me coming, they just open their arms. If even they they won't do it with nobody else, they say, "Here come grandma, come on." Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way, dear. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Well, you know, it's great talking to you. I miss talking to everybody, you know, because everybody's online now and they don't talk on the phone that much. But I still have a few friends that we talk on the phone. Absolutely, we'll we'll just be old school and and uh, any time, you know. Well, I've <laughs> you got, got your number and you have yep. mine, so I feel free to be able to call any time. I ain't and going I'll, nowhere. <laughs> and I just want to say one more thing that uh-huh. you know. You know, I see that you're going to be celebrating quite a momentous year this year, and I, I oh yes, I, I just want you to know the number eight is infinity. Oh great! So really? you look, you look at that and interpret it, and 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 it's just a number. It's it, because I feel your youthfulness, and you know, and your eternal <laughs> joy. So that 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 has nothing to do with you know with thank you happy, Donna. I never, I don't even feel it. Uh, you know what? Because I feel in my heart that all the gifts that God gave me, I want to use them before I leave here. God bless you. Yes, and indeed. you have to stay fit as fit as possible. Like I tell my husband and my close friends, I still cheat a lot with different foods you're not supposed to eat. But so other than that, I do try to keep myself. 
in good physical shape. <laughs> okay, well, you can just have some chocolate once in a while. <laughs> yes, exactly. You're right, you're right, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I send you all kinds of love, and we are so, so honored to have you as a such a, an incredible guest with your a name that is so perfect for Love's a Secret Weapon, Darlene yes, Love. I'm going I'm to remember that one, and it's so true. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I love you. you take God care bless you. Me. I love you too, honey. All right, sweetheart. Bye-bye. Bye, darling. Bye-bye. What an interesting life Darlene's had, Donna, and what a great interview. It's so good to hear you two just, you know, chat like a couple of old <laughs> girlfriends. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> Oh, no, I knew it as soon as that came out of my mouth. I meant girlfriends who have known each other for a yeah, long time. Yeah, it's, it's, tempting. it's tempting to go there, especially, you know, with the likes of Jane Fonda, who, who is the perpetual, uh, you know, Vogue model. And, uh, and actually, oh, Darlene yeah. um, was talking mm. about, you know, returning 80 and, um, you know, and maintaining yeah. a healthy, you know, physique and keeping herself as youthful. And, Honestly, when I saw her just not that long ago perform with little Stephen, she was wearing tight silver lame pants, and man, her legs are in great shape. So, you know, I mean, it just shows you that um, n- numbers are, are all uh, just relative and irrelevant, Absolutely. depending on your attitude and, you know, how you take care of yourself and the blessings that you're given. But, but oh my, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> she went through, you know, what so many people in show business and the music industry, you know, just <laughs> lived through for the last 60 years. Absolutely. I mean, she's run the full gamut as she, you know, spoke about when she was, you know, really the featured person on the wonderful documentary 20 Feet from Stardom, uh, which, of course, won the Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature, um, where she really, you know, honestly sort of charts out uh, what she did in her early career with Phil Spector, as well as her own recordings with The Blossoms and what happened subsequent to that, where she did have a spell of being out of the music business and the difficulty in getting back before, you know, her real, you know, triumphant return, you know, more recently, whether it's been on Broadway, in film, you know, um, many uh, listeners would probably know her from the Lethal Weapon movies playing Danny Glover's wife in that, as, as well as her new records and her performance on, on David Lennon. Uh, oh, my yeah. gosh, did I look forward to that every Christmas, you know, singing, Absolutely. I think, one of her earliest yeah. records. And, you know, she and I had... Quite a few things in common. She was an artist on Challenge Records very early on. Then she became an artist on mm-hmm. Capitol Records, and um, and working with yes. all the musicians that we worked with together from the Wrecking Crew, all the West Coast A list guys. So yeah, I mean that's yeah that's the thing I I kind of noticed this when looking at some of the records she did. We'll talk about Shindig soon and and how you work there, and many of those Wrecking Crew musicians were on Shindig. But, yeah, if we look at some of the people who she was in the recording studio with, you know, people like the arranger Jack Nitschke, uh, Hal Blaine, the drummer on, on a lot of those recordings, Al Delory on, I think, um, piano. Yes, absolutely. It? I hope I've got that right. You know, you all worked with so many of those wonderful A-list uh, musicians, which in some ways I think Darlene's story is a little bit similar to many of them. You know, I know many years ago there was – you know, that documentary about the Wrecking Crew and how we often didn't know their names, but we certainly knew their sound. And in the case of Darlene, in the early days, we often didn't know her name, but we definitely knew oh, that boy. voice. It, it's an you you know, unmistakable so, voice. You are so right about that. Her voice is so distinctive. You can tell her voice in a crowd, you know, I mean, and, and especially on <laughs> Shindig when we had our big cast ensembles you know in at the end of every show you know you could mm-hmm. her voice is so distinct that it it stands out and her personality you know she's she had occasions on shindig every so often where the producer jack good gave her an opportunity to do mm-hmm. a solo um because you know she deserved it and um she yeah. you know the i loved what she said in the interview of basically what it what she was talking about is equality when she was saying that you know all these great mm-hmm. acts from britain from you know from the east coast from the west coast and everywhere in between uh coming to our stage and on shindig and you know treating us 
like <laughs> like we were special or celebrities <laughs> and all we could think of was oh my gosh you guys are incredible i mean the likes of of sam cook or james brown or jackie wilson or rita franklin yeah. you know i mean mm. among so many and then of course you know in los angeles we had the great privilege of the stones and the kinks and the zombies and the animals and you name it from britain um so uh it was it was uh, just an extraordinary exchange but but that sense of equality yeah yeah and that's so true i mean it sounds like um you know darlene had similar experiences to you on shindig where jack good created that atmosphere of what you've called inclusivity and as darlene put it you know kind of a family um you know there weren't you know as you said there were these amazing artists coming on but there wasn't this kind of hierarchy of well they're the stars this week or or that you know everyone was really featured i think to their best effect and worked with jack good and other people on that show to kind of showcase people in the best way. Indeed, it was a, how do you say, you know, Mm. a stellar example of how it can be. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yep, that's so true because often, you know, unfortunately, and I know we've spoken about situations where, you know, it wasn't that way, whether for you or for me or for other people, but to be on that TV series where you were able to go there every week and work with someone who was a, me- a mentor and, and really wanted to showcase talent and was very respectful of the talent, um, you know, it doesn't come along all the time. And I think often we realise those things, you know, after we no longer have those. Um, you know, Shindig didn't go for a long time, but it certainly cast a long shadow both on rock music but also your life darlene's life a whole range of people who appeared on shindig and i know i was i was reading an interview with darlene i see in take note which is an online publication of the berkeley college of music and she discussed a whole range of artists she'd worked with and her, her work of course with phil Spector and so on but um you know she kind of spoke about things like working with sam cook um on his records and of course sam cook was the first guest on shindig. indeed oh, magical unbelievable uh, i enjoyed i enjoyed that that experience so much it was so uh, touching beyond you know beyond music mm. it was um a, truly a spiritual experience being being you know with a, a person like sam cook you know change is going to come and chain gang and you know songs like that mm. that are are still totally relevant today and I, I'm kind of referencing, you know, I see that Darlene was part of um, Elvis's comeback special on NBC. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yep. In 1968, I yes. think it was. Yes. That's amazing. Uh, let's see what I'm just going through her incredible bio. <laughs> and yeah, and then she there, began working there. with little Steven you know, doing um, Christmas music. And we definitely want to play her baby, Please Come Home. And let's listen to that right now. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town, girl. Santa Claus is coming to town. Santa Claus is coming to town. Well, she's you and your Now, Darlene sang background on Shindig while I was doing the lead for Santa Claus is Coming to Town. That is our Christmas, uh, how should we say, uh, tribute and uh, um, a live performance as well as her very classic performance that, like you said, she performed every year on The Letterman Mm. Show for so many years. So amazing, which also led to her relationship you know, with um, with uh, uh, Paul Schaefer, 
and and then Paul Schaefer, mm -hmm. you know, one mm -hmm. thing leads to another, and um, and Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing how many yep. lives yep. she touched. I think she said that when she was on the Rocker Hall of Fame, you know, that she reunited with uh, Leon Russell, who was part of the Wrecking Crew and, and a musician right, yes. on, uh, on Shindig. And I had the pleasure of working with him as well. Just thinking about, you know, the Christmas songs. And I know Darlene spoke about how much she, you know, loves Christmas and, um, you know, as did you when we did a, I think our oh, last yeah. episode of last year for oh, the first yeah. season of the podcast. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> that was a great part of our, our interview, you know, that, that she just really came out with, this is a time for giving, not taking. And, you know, and then we just mm. kind of expanded mm. on that note of wanting it to be like that every day. And uh, she truly is that way. Boy, oh boy, I'm looking to see. Wow, she recorded a duet with Bette Midler. Wow. <laughs> That's right, I do remember that. Bette Midler decided to do a um, an album of old, um, uh, you know, girl group songs because, of course, Bette Midler had come up with so much of that sound as well, and so many of her early records were were touched by that. And with her background, you know, singers the Harlettes and Darlene, I think, and Bette have been, I think, friends for quite a while. And so when Bette decided to do "He's Sure the Boy I Love." I think she invited Darlene. When you hold me tight, everything's right, crazy as it seems. I'm his, whatever he is, and I forget all of my dreams. And everybody knows he doesn't hang diamonds around my neck. He ain't got none. And all he's got is unemployment checks. Yeah, he sure ain't the boy I've been dreaming of, but he sure the boy. What an incredible mm -hmm. treat for me to go with our mutual friend, Mary Wilson, not that long ago in Palm Springs mm -hmm. to an event that Darlene was performing at. And, you know, the three of us um, came from that period of time, that early 60s period where, you know, the industry mm -hmm. was still so naive, it wasn't even considered, um, you know, a long, long lasting business it it was it was just so spontaneous and so <laughs> raw that you know all of us kind of came from that particular you know nucleus of of entrepreneurship and then all these all these decades later you know for Mary and I to go backstage and see Darlene and and uh, visit with her and I even met her son who travels with her and um, I know she's mm. she's just mm. aching to get back on stage. I mean, she's she's turning eighty this July, and she's she's probably you know back of her mind planning the next Christmas show in New Jersey. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? That I think so many people want to get back on on um, the stage, and you know it's obviously very difficult right now. But as we've spoken about before, you know, hopefully as the vaccine rolls out, hopefully we can eventually see people back on stage, or at least. I think, as we've said before, some innovative ways of getting music out there. I've gone to a couple of concerts here in Adelaide where, you know, uh, thankfully we're trucking pretty well oh, that's you know, in terms of the virus and as so is, you know, the rest of Australia, you know, fortunately. But, you know, we kind of were in this recent one where we went and saw some bands where we were in what were called pods and essentially they were these little raised sort of platforms and you had a little fence around it and you were there with only people you knew so there were six of us in this so-called pod and the next pod's quite a distance away and you stay there <laughs> and you can kind of rock out uh to the band on stage <laughs> you know safely and I do like sitting down at a concert I can't do the mosh pit so I was actually happy there were chairs in there and they you know, you, you can um, get your drinks delivered on a little golf cart and that allowed us all to be there and be very orderly and safe while enjoying that music. So, you know, hopefully that's the kind of thing that can happen in the future. But it would be great to see Darlene back on stage, particularly at Christmas, because that is what she is so um, known for. You know, it's funny, I was reading, um, and I think this is accurate, that originally when she recorded Christmas Baby, Please Come Home, it was planned to be released at Christmas in 1963 and with the assassination of President Kennedy. 
the decision was made, no one really feels like mm. experiencing Christmas this year or, or the kind of funk that the country was in. And so I think it was delayed. You're such a good researcher, Adam. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you. But there's a lot, there's a lot to research in her case. Uh, you know, I know you've seen Darlene perform at various times throughout the years, particularly recently. And it was lovely to hear her remembrances of Mary Wilson because I think there's been such a shock from people that she is no longer here. I met uh, Mary in, I think it was back in 2012, she was touring Australia, um, or at least she she had come to Adelaide to do her Lena Horne uh, show, Stormy Weather, and so we met her sort of afterwards. She was a lovely lady, and so it's, uh, you know, nice to hear people remembering her and, and, as Darlene said, you know, what she did in terms of the Supremes and then what she went on to do in terms of her books, in terms of her touring with, yeah. You know, the, the day after Mary's passing, um, I was just getting out of the bath mm. and um, my hair was half dry and and my phone lit up mm. and a friend of mine, actually, you know, one of our interviews, early on interviews, Alison Martino, who is a journalist, and she, mm. she, she texted me and said, mm. Um, I just gave uh, Spectrum Television your your phone number. You'd be expecting a call from so and so, and and so of course I know Allison, and so I was fine with that. But ordinarily, you would you would, you'd want someone to ask you first. But <laughs> wet, especially with wet hair. You know, you won't see me with wet hair on the. Obviously, you didn't have wet hair when you went on, but you know, I'm <laughs> you know until I've got that hair dryer out, and so <laughs> that's by the by, really. <laughs> People want to know my morning routine. Uh, well, one day we may see you on Zoom. You never know. At any rate, yeah, it was so stunning to, to actually hear of, of of Mary's passing. So, um, so you know, not that mm. long, maybe half an hour. Uh, I was speaking with a journalist on Spectrum Television in this in this country, and and if mm. anyone is curious, you can go on my facebook page and find that interview um it was quite a tribute to mary Mm. and um the uh the woman who who was uh uh, the reporter was quite lovely and she uh she actually even played a a clip of of me on shindig just to acquaint the audience with who i was Mm. and um yeah you just you just Mm. never know it's like Something like that happens, and suddenly you you feel like you're part of a community, and um and the, you know that's mm-hmm. why I reached out to to Darlene. And by the way, I just would like to step back a few bits when you were talking about theater and people, you know, going back to the theater, going back to performance, you know, mm-hmm. in theaters uh, or concert halls, and you know, it really reminded me of opera houses. Or, or even um, Carnegie Hall, which I is fashioned after an, a, a, an opera house, mm. where you know, yes, there's a downstairs mass of people, but all along the sides of the walls of the theaters are separate balcony seating. And what you're describing mm. in those pods, mm. you know, in in the case of coronavirus isolation, you know, it's very reminiscent of the. Um, traditional theater you know when you looked all around these great opera houses and these great theaters where you know tier after tier after how many stories tall maybe eight stories tall and you'd see these little pods you know Mm -hmm. these little balconies Mm -hmm. separated and um and people being able to sit in their own little parties all around and um so Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. i guess things are really not that different you know in in essence um that that we can relate to and by the way speaking of theater i also would love yeah. for you we talked about hairspray and when darlene replaced one of the mm. characters on broadway would you remind us of who she replaced i can that was motor mouth mabel motor mouth mabel <laughs> well it's a very you know, cool name <laughs> I, do, I don't recall exactly what year i was in new york and i saw hairspray and uh it was just incredibly mm. relatable and of course the music is great but um i i just wanted to because if anybody who's listening mm. look at what hairspray represented a girl with a flip and a headband and when i saw (laughs) the image 
that John Waters chose for his mm. little masterpiece. And of course, the period of the um, racial, you know, issues that went on in that period. Yeah. I actually had an opportunity to meet him. And I gave him my album, Beach Blanket Bingo, and I showed him the cross reference, you know, <laughs> same time period. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the headband. Here it is. The, mm-hmm. Here it is. There's the girl with the flip and the headband that became your image for your play, for your story, for your movie. <laughs> How cool. That's, <laughs> that's fantastic. And, and anyone that I know we've spoken about that album cover before, but anyone that wants to revisit it, I mean, it's just a just put wonderful it side by photo. Side. Um, well, you know, let's taken. see. Um, I think I mentioned to you, I, <laughs> the fellow that took that for Capital was a man named George German, mm-hmm. and he was also responsible for yep, photographing right. the Pet Sounds album many many others that's but. awesome that's uh what masterpieces of of time you know those those albums are and you know you kind of remind me when we're talking about you know more recently with hairspray and and the kind of and of course you know that one just fits in you know so well with so much we speak about in this in this podcast in terms of that that sort of mid-century time that john waters um you know wonderfully um you know brought back to life uh but you know 20 feet from stardom of course was that wonderful uh, documentary that we spoke about at the start of our our chat and i actually watched that in in a um i guess it was a workshop um you know for for people sort of early in their career and we discussed the themes and and the reason i think that the the people that ran the workshop put it on is is there's a lot of these parallels whether you're working in performance whether you're working elsewhere but the, these ideas that sometimes we look for the big hit that we hope we're going to have and it may or may not come or the importance of being conscious of what we want from a career, whether it's to be, you know, the quote unquote, the star of the show, or whether we're happy to contribute in other ways. And it seems from reading what Darlene has spoken about, what she's written about before, that for her, it's always been a lot about the music and wanting to perform and wanting to be on that stage. And as she covers in in the documentary, there was a time when she wasn't on the stage, that she stepped away for a while. And when she came back, it was difficult to, to get work. And so she was actually working as a cleaner until one day where she was at the house that she was cleaning for a client on the radio up comes baby please come home and I think she kind of took that as a sign that she needs to get well back you there. have to say you know little Saint Nick he came he came along tapped her on the shoulder woke up her <laughs> conscience and led her on her on her glory path mm. because look at her now you know yes we all had to take time off and yeah. she's taking yep. time off but her spirit is so alive and I so appreciate her time and and our time together, paying tribute to the great Darlene Love. Rock out, Darlene, and we're going to play more of your music on our way out of <laughs> Love's A Secret Weapon. Until next time, everyone. Thank you. Love's